right. Yeah. Yeah. This is Mr. Dunn, and I think he comes from NBC or uh, NBC. NBC Weekend Channel 2 News yeah. and does the meteorology report. So he's in here to help you understand weather and climate a little bit better and answer the questions of those groups that came up with some really good questions, which we have one of the groups in here. And they're ready to go. Well, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Rob, and uh, I do the weather on the weekends uh, on TV. If you ever watch the, the weekend news with mom and dad or grandpa and grandpa, uh, you might catch me doing the weather. Anybody here want to be a meteorologist someday? Raise your hand. Yeah? Well, we'll see. Because when I was about your age, I got to hear a meteorologist speak. I thought, oh, that sounds really cool. And then I ended up being one. So maybe, maybe one of you will uh, try it out someday. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Cool. So what I brought along for you is I brought along a bunch of stuff that the meteorologists use when we study the weather and we put together a forecast and see what we expect it to be tomorrow and the next day and five days from now and ten days from now. And I also brought along a list of questions that you guys submitted and during the course of our presentation I'll answer a couple of those questions and then at the end I've got a really cool question for you, uh, but we'll save it for the end. So the first thing I want to talk about is instruments that meteorologists use to study the weather. But first of all, what does meteorology even mean? Who can raise their hand and tell me what the definition is? Yeah. Um, the study of weather. Exactly. Air high five. Right on. That's exactly right. <laughs> and what about the word climatology? Have you guys heard that one before? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, when you hear the word climatology, what, what word sounds familiar? Climate. Yeah, so if meteorology is the study of weather, what do you think climatology is? Climate. Climate. You're exactly right, yeah. So the, what, what I do as a meteorologist is I study the weather. And the weather is what's happening right now and what's happening kind of tomorrow and the next day. Climate, though, is what happens over a long period of time. Like back when the dinosaurs were still walking around, there was a very different climate. So a meteorologist like me studies the weather that's happening right here and right now, and we make ideas of what's going to happen in the future. A climatologist, rather, studies the weather that happened a long time ago, and they study what they think is going to happen in the future, uh, a long ways out. And some of the instruments that meteorologists and climatologists use are actually the same ones. So you guys are already smart. What is an instrument that a meteorologist would use if we wanted to go outside and see how hot it was? It's really hot today, too. What do you think? Yeah, right? It's that thing that the nurse uh, sticks in your mouth and you're not feeling good at school. Or not feeling well at school, I'm sorry. Excuse my <laughs> poor grammar there. So we got a thermometer here, right? Pretty basic, right? And why are there two sets of numbers on each side? Who can tell me what that means? Uh, yeah. Fahrenheit and Celsius. Yeah, exactly. So if I said 32 degrees Fahrenheit, what does that mean to you guys? Like if we were drinking lemonade, what would, why would 32 degrees Fahrenheit be an important number for you? Uh, who hasn't answered the question? Yeah. It'd be cold. Uh, it'd be cold, but just exactly how cold? Oh, exactly. Freezing cold. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is that temperature on the Fahrenheit scale where water becomes, liquid water becomes ice. Now what if I said zero degrees Celsius? What do you think? Freezing. It means the exact same thing. How crazy is that, right? And in fact, most of the rest of the world, the whole globe, <laughs> uses the, they would say, zero degrees Celsius because they use the Celsius system instead of Fahrenheit. But when you get to uh, probably middle school, I would assume middle school, and definitely in high school, you're going to have to learn both scales. <laughs> Especially if you want to be a meteorologist, you're going to want to know both sides. So this is a really important tool uh, that meteorologists use when we want to find out something as basic as uh, how hot or cold it is outside. What's uh, another instrument that uh, a meteorologist would use? What do you think? Yeah? A barometer. What's a barometer do? Anybody know? Uh, with, uh, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, I brought along a little video. And this kind of explains the you number know, sound. You guys like cartoons, right? Okay, we're going to watch a quick cartoon. Aristotle famously said, Nature fears of empty space when he claims that. Well, and how was it invented? Well, it took a while. Because the theory of Aristotle and other ancient philosophers regarding the impossibility of a vacuum seemed to hold true in everyday life, few seriously thought to question it for nearly 2,000 years until necessity rate and could lift no more than 10.3 meters of water. However, the idea of a vacuum existing at all was still considered controversial, and the excitement over Galileo's unorthodox theory led Gasparo Berti to conduct a simple but brilliant experiment to demonstrate that it was possible. A long tube was filled with water and placed standing in a shallow pool with both ends plugged. 
The bottom end of the tube was then opened, and water poured out into the basin, until the level of the water remaining in the tube was 10.3. With a gap remaining at the top, and no air having entered the tube, Berti had succeeded in directly creating a stable vacuum. But even though the possibility of a vacuum had been demonstrated, not everyone was satisfied with Galileo's idea that this empty preventing the water okay, levels in the tube here. from <laughs> dropping further. He realized that the experiment was not only a tool to create a vacuum, but operated as a balance between the atmospheric pressure on the water outside the tube and the pressure from the water column inside the tube. The water level in the tube decreases until the two pressures are equal, so this which is just happens to be when the water is at 10.3 meters. This idea was not easy to accept, as Galileo and others had traditionally uh, I'll send this thought that atmospheric so air had no weight oh, and absorbs no pressure. The, the thing Fort Kelly decided to repeat Berti's experiment with mercury instead of water. I'm going to pause it here, too. So here's the, the idea here, is that when the pressure around you changes, uh, it not only impacts uh, us a little bit, but it also really, really impacts the weather. Has anyone ever heard of a low pressure system? I think you all have. Have you ever heard of a storm system before? Well, then you've automatically already heard about a low pressure system. A uh, low pressure system is just another way of saying storm system. So what a barometer does is it measures when the atmospheric pressure changes. And when the atmospheric pressure gets lower, that means, remember we talked about low pressure, that means a storm system. So if you're at a barometer and the pressure is falling, that means there's a storm system nearby. And if the pressure is rising, that means there's actually nicer weather nearby and you don't have to worry about it anyway. So that's a good question there. What's another instrument that a meteorologist would use to study the weather? Anemometer. Anemometer, right? Who knows what an anemometer is? Nobody knows. Oh, oh, I know. Yeah, what do you think? Doesn't it, it measure the wind speed? It sure does, yeah. Have you guys ever seen something like this before? Yeah. Okay, you all like cereal, right? <laughs> so when you have your cereal in the morning, right, you have a bowl, you pour your cereal in, you pour your milk in. What happens if you keep pouring the milk in? What's going to happen to it? The cereal is going to overflow out of the bowl. Yeah, that's no good, right? This works the same way as a cereal bowl, but instead, once it gets filled up, instead of overflowing, it just moves and the next one comes in, and the next one fills up, and the next one fills up. So eventually, all that happens is that as soon as the little um, uh, the, the cup here is full of air, it just starts to move. So if the wind is very soft one day, it just kind of very slowly move. But if it's really, really windy outside, uh, these can really book it really, really fast. So the faster an anemometer spins, the faster the wind is outside. And the slower an anemometer spins, uh, the, the less wind there is outside. What's another instrument that a meteorologist would use? Yep. A sling psychrometer? Yeah, so I don't have one of those. But a sling psychrometer, yeah, that's a pretty cool one. Uh, what's some other good stuff? Yep, yeah, in the back. Yeah. So if we were getting a spaceship, and fly into space right this very minute, and look down on Florida, we are like right about there. This is what it looks like. And what are these white things here? Yeah, so what this is, is it's a satellite picture from just a little bit ago, and I look at this, the first thing I do when I get to work to put together a forecast is look at this. So that's what it looks like right this very minute, and then you can put it in a time-lapse mode, and you can see how the clouds have changed uh, throughout the day. So this morning we had a couple little ones pop up, but notice how more clouds are developing as it gets really hot outside, right? We're getting more cloud cover, especially over the land parts uh, here in Florida. And all a satellite does is it kind of works like a camera. So let's pretend my phone here is a camera, and you guys are the planet Earth, okay? This is now a satellite, and all it does is it goes over top of space and it takes a picture. <laughs> it goes around and then takes a picture. And then it sends all those pictures back to space, so that we can see them here. So, let's see right there. Oops, I didn't take the picture. That's fine. So we'll go over here. The satellite takes the picture. All right. So that picture then gets sent back to Earth. So I know that. What's your name? I know that he's right here because I can see him on the satellite image. And this happens every single day, 24 hours a day. And what it sends back is a picture that looks just like this, so we can get an idea of where the clouds are. And that's a really important way of 
learning where storm systems are. Do hurricanes have a lot of clouds with them? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Do, uh, let's see, do nice weather days have lots of clouds? No. no. Not so much, yeah. So if you see a whole lot of clouds in one area, chances are there's probably a storm system. If there's a whole lot of them, it might be a big one, uh, like a hurricane maybe for example. Okay, what's another instrument that a meteorologist would use? Yeah? The, the rain gauge? A rain gauge, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And boy, these come in handy here in Florida, especially in Immokalee, because you guys can get some really big storms, especially during the summer, right? This is probably the easiest tool in the world, because all you do is you go outside and you stick it in the ground, and just let the weather do the rest of it for you. So if you're interested in the weather, this would be a cool thing. I think this was the $1.50 or so. And all you do is you stick it outside and you wait for it to rain, and when it fills up, it'll tell you how much rain fell in the course of the day. And every day you've got to dump it out. You can't let the can't let the totals add up, and that's how you get a, an accurate measurement each day on how much rain falls. What's another a tool that a uh, meteorologist might use? Um, yep. A wind vane? Yeah, what's a wind vane? I don't have one with me. What's, what's a wind vane? It's similar to an anemometer. Yep. Yeah, um, oftentimes where I grew up, uh, weather vanes are on top of barns, and sometimes they're in the shape of a chicken. <laughs> so, whatever which way the chicken's face is, is, is facing toward is the direction that the wind is blowing, because it just kind of moves around with whatever direction the wind is coming through. What's another uh, tool a meteorologist might use to study the weather? Ooh, yeah. I don't know if this one can count, but I remember in fifth grade, there's something called hypometer or something like that. Okay. <laughs> Let's, I don't have one of those here with me either. Let's think about uh, birthday parties. What's, uh, what's some stuff you use at a birthday party? Cake. Cake? What about decorations? Yep. Balloons. Oh, all right, balloons. Now we're getting toward it. Have you guys ever heard of a weather balloon before? Yes. Okay, raise your hand. Yes, i got to make sure we're on the same page. Okay, so here's what a weather balloon does. Two times a day, every single, uh, on almost every single uh, part of the United States and around the world, Meteorologists will fill up a big balloon, they'll set it into the air, and what it'll do is it'll measure what's going to happen in space. Now, you think it's a little balloon like, a, like at a birthday party? No. 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 It's like a balloon. Like one of these little things? No. Maybe a bigger one, right? Yeah. Have you guys seen one? Way much bigger. Yeah, so I brought one along here. Hot air balloon. 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 Okay, so just for comparison, this is what you use at your birthdays. And this is the size of the balloon that a meteorologist is going to use to fill it up. Are you going to blow it? Oh, it would take me forever. <laughs> but uh, could you stand up and grab the side there? We'll, we'll stretch it out so you guys can see how big it is. And you can grab the piece. Yeah, so these get really big, right? And what we would do is we'd fill it full of helium. And when these are uh, fully blown up, probably five or six of you guys can fit inside this when they're blown up. They get really, really, really big. And what happens is you can let it go. So let's pretend it's full of helium and it floats off into space. What good is it a balloon if it just floats into space? Not so much, right? So what should this do to try and tell you what the weather is going on upstairs? What do you think? Um, they have a tool tied up tied to the balloon yeah. to measure the air pressure. That's exactly right. It's called a sonode. And what this sono does is it kind of works like a cell phone. You guys both talk on the phone, right? Okay. okay, so let's put the phone up to your ear. Let's say you're talking to Grandma and Grandpa, and Grandma and Grandpa say hello, and you say? Hello. hello. And they say, how's school, and you say? Good. So what's going on here? You're giving Grandma and Grandpa information, and they're asking you questions, right? Yeah. This works the same way. So as the balloon floats higher into the sky, it kind of, just like a phone call, it gets on the phone and it sends back all this good information about what the air pressure is and what the temperature is and what the wind speed is the higher up in the sky we go. Now, here's a question for you. When you let go of a balloon, does it go straight up in the air yeah. or does it go to one side? It goes to one side. Raise your hand if you think it goes up and straight up in the air. Raise your hand if you think it goes to the side. Or exactly right. Now, why does it go to one side? Anybody know? Because the wind's pushing you. Yeah, that's, all right, so here's another example. You guys are Florida, so your palm trees and beaches and alligators, and I'm the wind, okay? So if I come against you guys, and I'm going to bump into this palm tree, and I'll bump into this building, and this alligator, I can't move very fast, right, because they keep bumping into stuff. But if I had a pair of wings, and I flew right over top of you guys, would I move a lot faster? Yes. That's exactly right. So the higher up in the sky you go, there's less stuff to run into, so the wind can move a whole lot faster. So, let me switch graphics. So what this, uh, what this is, is it's the globe, so here's North America, and there's Florida, and what this is showing you is where the wind is blowing on every single inch of the earth, which is kind of 
abstract to think about because of how big the Earth is, but this is where all the wind is going. So I'll zoom in so you can see over Florida. Can you go rotate it? Can you? Yep. So, the winds aren't terribly strong today, right? It's not super duper windy outside, but they are coming in from the southeast. That's one of the reasons why it's so humid outside today. But you get the idea, right? Here at the surface, the wind isn't very strong. But if we were to go higher up in the sky, who thinks you're going to see a lot more wind? Raise your hand. Everybody's interested. Okay, let's take a look. So, we'll go from the surface, and we'll go up to 500 millibars. And the colors are a little brighter, right? The lines are moving a little bit faster. I see red on the top left. Yeah. Let's go even higher up yet. See how things change. Okay, so now we're even higher in the sky. There's purple! So the winds are moving a lot faster here because we've got uh, shades of red. You see a lot more lines, and they're moving a whole lot faster. The higher up we are in the sky, remember, there's less stuff to run into. So the wind can move a whole lot faster. Yes? I see a little bit of purple too. Yeah. Uh, I think the purple one is uh, this up here? Yeah. Yeah, that's where it's moving really fast. You guys who are seeing purple, what do you think you're fighting? What, what are you looking at? Storms. Uh, not storms. Jet streams. Uh, let's get up. Oh, who's that? Me. Right on. Oh, it is. Yeah. Really what you guys just identified, without even knowing it, what you guys just found was the jet stream. And the jet stream is like this river of wind that's up in the sky, and all it is is a wind of really, really, really fast wind. So the higher up in the sky we go, the more we can look for that jet stream. And this right here is the jet stream, and it goes all across the entire country. It circles the whole globe. And that's a lot of wind that uh, moves a lot of storm systems, especially in the northern half of the United States. Yeah. That's why planes fly up in the jet stream, because whenever you're flying in the jet stream, you're like, you're going against it, you're going along with it. So like, if you're in California, you're going to fly this way. You take a plane, yeah. you're going to this way. Yeah, it's a lot easier to move along with the wind than to try and fight it the whole way back. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, what was your question? Is that why if you've got a plane to Texas, it's quicker than driving because it's just faster? That too. Yeah, there's less, uh, less traffic. That's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> so it's easier to fly in a plane to Texas than drive on the ground because you can just kind of go in a plane, go in a stop at traffic lights, go in a stop at McDonald's, you can just kind of go right there. Yeah. The yeah. <laughs> okay, what's another instrument that a meteorologist might use when we're studying the weather? And if you've ever watched the weather on TV in your entire life, you will have seen this instrument been used on TV. I like to point it like this. I talk about rain and hail, and I point out tornadoes, and I can show you where hurricanes are. Uh, close. It starts with an R. It ends with an R. Radar! Uh, yeah, exactly. Do you guys... Is what our radar looks like. So if you guys are ever on TV someday doing the weather, you'll be saying just like here, and you'll point and stuff. Is there a lot of rain today? No. no. We got a little bit down here, uh, well south of us, but there's not a whole lot of rain. But we can uh, zoom in on it. Okay. There we go. There's some showers uh, down south of Marco Island. Now, how on earth? How on earth is a radar whether there's rain here and not here? Anybody know? Yeah. Satellites? Uh, no, not satellites. Well, how about this? I'll just show you in a little uh, in a demonstration first, and then we'll go from there. Yes. I need uh, three volunteers, please. Others, please. Let's do one, two, three, right in front. Come on, us. <laughs> okay. What's your name? Rose. Steven. Steven. Uh, Evans? Yes. Okay. Rose is going to be, Rose is our Doppler radar, okay? So, Rose is an instrument uh, that looks like a giant basketball. <laughs> when it's, it's really about as big as this room sometimes in some cases. And what a radar does, you guys all see this, right? Yeah. What is this? A flashlight. It's a flashlight, right? You guys can tell the light is on, but you don't see waves of energy coming out from the flashlight, right? Yeah. No. So this, you got to keep that in mind here. So Rose, would you hold that, please? And boys, stand on either side, please. Okay, uh, Stephen, right? Yeah. Stephen is a thunderstorm. So there's your dark storm cloud. And Evans? He's 
also a thunderstorm cloud. So we've got the big dark thunderstorm clouds, right? Okay, so what a Doppler radar tower does is it sends a beam of energy out into the atmosphere. You can all tell that these lights are on, right? Yeah. But do you don't see waves of light coming down from the ceiling, right? No. So this is at a range in the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see with our eyes, but we all agree that it's happening, right? Yes. So the way this works is if I was to take this tennis ball and throw it against the wall, what would happen to it? It would bounce back. Right. It would bounce right. If we all went into the parking lot where there's nothing to run into and I threw the ball, what would happen to it? It's going to it. Okay, keep that in mind, all right? So, remember, Rose is a Doppler radar tower. So what Rose does is she sends a beam of energy. So turn your flashlight on and point it in that direction. And pretend this beam of energy here is coming out from the flashlight. And what it does, and by the way, you guys are floored again. So you're palm trees and alligators and houses and everything. So that beam of energy gets shot out from Rose the radar, and it flies all over the sky. And what it's looking for is something to run into. And what it runs into is raindrops and hailstones and snowflakes and that kind of stuff. So remember, you guys are Florida, right? Are there any thunderstorms out this way? Yeah. No. So as the view of energy flies over top of you guys, we know there's nothing to run into, so the radar looks like this and this. There's no, there's no uh, stuff to run into. But she's got thunderstorms on either side of her, so what should Rose be doing that she's not doing right now to take a look at all around her? What do you think? Yeah, Rose, you start spinning. <laughs> Yeah, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week, what uh, radar towers, just like Rose do, is they spin around in a big circle. And all they do as they spin around is they send out a beam of energy here. So let's pretend that we stop right at Stephen, and the beam of energy flies out, it bounces into Stephen, it hits him, and then it bounces right back, just like if we threw it against the wall. So it runs into Stephen, and then it comes right back. What gets sent back to the meteorologist is something that looks like this. And then what pops up if it's green, that means it's rain. If it's yellow or red, it means it's heavy rain. And sometimes, it, I'm not going to have it down here, but if it's purple or pink, that means it's a snowfall. Oh, <laughs> so you get the idea here? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, radar towers like Rose are just spinning around in a circle, <laughs> sending out energy, looking for stuff to run into, like Evans and Steven over there. Nothing to run into? We got a nice clear day. You get the idea? Yes. Okay. I'll take that back. Oh, wait, actually, stay right there. You guys all know about tornadoes, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you know that Rose, the radar, is the best way to find a tornado? No. Okay, so we just, we just talked about that if um, the beam of energy hit Stephen and bounced back, it would show you that there's rain. But what does a tornado do that a regular thunderstorm isn't doing? Twisting. Spinning, right? So let's pretend that Evans is a tornado now. <laughs> Evans, you also have to be spinning around. <laughs> so, I'll stand on this side now. Rose, that way. The beam of energy is going to hit Evans, right? But Evans is spinning, Stephen is not. So when the energy hits Evans now, it's, gonna, it, it, it's able to tell that this half of the storm is moving this direction, and this half of the storm is moving this direction. If two things are moving in opposite directions, what are they going to do? Emerge. They're going to spin, and that's what gives you a tornado. So with using the energy that comes out from Rose the radar, we can tell if the storm is spinning, like a tornado evens, or if the storm is just being a regular thunderstorm like Steven, or it's not rotating. You get the idea? Steven. Okay. All right, guys, thanks very much. I'll take that back. Steven, you're All right, good job, buddy. <laughs> Thank you back to the weather balloon, I got ahead of myself. There's a really cool video that shows you how high weather balloons go. Okay, so we're kind of taking a step back, but remember our uh, weather balloon? How high these uh, balloons go up in the sphere? And we said it drifts off to one direction because the wind is stronger the higher in the sky we go. What this family did is what they attached a video camera to their weather balloon and they launched it, so it'll give you an idea of how high these go in space. So we're not going to watch the whole thing because it's kind of long, but I'll send the clip to your teacher so she can uh, show you. You put a video camera on a balloon. Yeah. It's not like, I would want that back. Okay, Jamie. Okay, so what you're looking at here is a video camera that you're going to put in this uh, orange case. And this works just like a Sano that, uh, um, what's your name, buddy? Jamie. Yeah, he's the one that uh, brought up the Sano thing. Works the same way, but in this case, it's just going to be a video camera to show you what it looks like as we go high in the sky. Flavor. Okay.
Okay, so pretend you're a meteorologist now. We've got our weather balloon all full. <clears throat> We're on the parking lot. Okay, so we're at the surface, and now we're getting a little bit higher in the sky. Notice what the weather balloon is doing. It's getting bounced around all over the place because the wind is really choppy here at the surface, remember? Because I keep bumping into everything. Oh, yeah. You didn't see the circle Yeah. I didn't see it. Can you see the circle of the Earth? Oh, dude. It's because every 250 miles of Earth's Okay, I understand, David. I do. Okay, bring it up. Okay, so it takes uh, two minutes for it to get about 3,000 feet off the ground. So it's moving pretty fast, too. This is uh, kind of booking it. And now we're getting into the part of the atmosphere. Now we're getting into the atmosphere where there's lots of clouds. So we're about 20,000 feet in the air. So. We're kind of in the area where airplanes fly. If you're flying to Texas or flying to California, uh, you're up in that kind of place in the atmosphere. I thought it was 80,000. Mm, that's probably too high for an airplane. Now we're at 30,000 feet. More airplanes are flying in this area. And it only took us 24 minutes, so less than the time we were speaking, this has already moved 30,000 uh, 30, Now, what is happening to our balloon as it moves higher in the atmosphere? And think about things like atmospheric pressure, like with that barometer we were talking about. Uh, is the balloon going to get bigger or smaller as it moves higher in the Small, space? Smaller. Mm, I don't know. Let's think about uh, the pressure differences. The pressure inside the air balloon here as it moves into space is actually going to make it get a lot bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, just like the balloons you have at your birthday party that you let go, it's going to pop somewhere very high in the atmosphere. <laughs> this one does not, this one does. <laughs> so their fold is just going to break as it hits the ground? That's a good question, yeah. What's going to happen, like if our case is a meteorologist with that uh, sano that's attached to it, what happens to the sano after the balloon pops? It's going to it floats off into space. Who um, thinks so it falls back to the earth? I think it's over. You're right. What is the earth mostly covered in? Water. Gravity. Water. Water, right. So most of them end up in the ocean or in the Gulf of Mexico or the Great Lakes and you never see them again. But sometimes they'll land in your backyard and the sound will say where you can send it back to so they can reuse it again at a different time. But we're really, really high in space now. And what do you notice about the, the balloon here? We're kind of above... Yeah, so we're now at 100,000 feet in the air. That's something like 19 miles in the sky. So we're really, really, really high up, up in the air. It's more steady than it was. Exactly, yeah. So the atmospheric pressure became so great inside the balloon that it actually made it pop. So now that camera is going to take the right all the way down to the earth. It's It'll move in a second. There we go. So now the camera or the sano that the meteorologist uses with the weather balloon is going to take the ride all the way down from the upper layers of the atmosphere and move all the way down to the surface. <laughs> do these people recollect their own? They do, yeah. yeah. Oh. They broke the through the ocean. They broke through the Uh, it's not going to move fast enough to catch fire, but like when the space shuttles and stuff come back, it gets really hot. It's, they're moving a lot faster than the weather balloon. Oh, this makes me want to go skydiving. So they had a, a GPS inside their phone, so what they did is they ended up being able to collect it. And unfortunately, the battery died just before it hit the Earth, so you're not going to be able to see the impact, but uh, that's how it all you know, comes with. No, it didn't die. Did it break? It's because, what is it? It's like the battery. Okay. Because the cold. So, I got one more thing to talk to you about now, and that would be tornadoes. You were already talking about uh, how the radar detects it, but do you guys know how tornadoes form? Yeah. So here's a couple of questions to get you started. Who knows how many tornadoes that Florida typically sees every year? Give me a number. Someone said one. It's a lot higher than one. Five. Way more than five. Thirty. Ten. 
More than 30. 25. Uh, more than 50. 78. Uh, less than 78. You're in the right ballpark. 16. On a typical year, the average number of tornadoes that Florida sees 25. is this many. 25. Typically, Florida sees 66 oh. tornadoes in a given year. That's actually a lot, right? But when you consider that there's 365 days in a year, that's a... Do they consider the tornadoes as hurricanes? No, tornadoes and hurricanes are different, yeah. Now let's think about the entire United States. In a typical year, what is the number of tornadoes that we typically million. see? What do you think? Uh, less than a million, though. What do you think? Around 1,000. Very close, exactly 1,200. That's really good close, buddy. <laughs> so tornadoes are actually very common here in the United States. So it's a good idea to know how they form, right? Yeah. So, uh, let's have you stand up again. You were our tornado before, right? Okay. Okay, well, okay, now, here's how tornadoes form. Do you remember in our demonstration where you guys are the earth and I was the wind and I kept bumping into you because I was going slower down at the surface but I could go a lot faster up in the sky? And think about what we looked at with this map here. The wind is moving a lot faster the higher in the sky you go. So what tends to happen is that the wind kind of does a little somersault <laughs> over top of itself when the, when the wind shear gets too great. So we're moving really fast up here and a little bit slower right here. So what starts to happen is you get like a horizontal uh, column of air and it just kind of starts to roll like this, like a paper towel tube. What happens if we get a thunderstorm to develop underneath our horizontally rotating column of air? Do you think it's going to stay horizontal or is it going to become vertical? Vertical. You think it's going to become vertical? Vertical. Vertical? Vertical. All right, let's give it a try here. This is a little test tornado. <laughs> you want to give it a try? What you're going to do is go da -da 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 -da, like a horizontal and then turn it vertical. So uh, like this. Horizontal, vertical. And make it vertical. <laughs> <laughs> and vertical. Oh, it didn't work the time. Here, I'll give it a try. Okay, so remember we're talking about a horizontal column of air. A thunderstorm develops underneath that horizontal column of air. And what happens is it becomes a vertical column of air. Oh. So what happens is we've got a tornado, right? Did it disappear? Yeah. yeah. That was cool. So we had a tornado and then it disappeared. Why did the tornado disappear? Well, here's the question. When you make cookies, can you make cookies without all the ingredients? Can you make no. chocolate chip cookies without chocolate chips? No. Yeah. It's funny if, you if you run out of the ingredients to make cookies, you can't make cookies. If you run out of the ingredients to make a tornado, like the right wind shear, you can't have a tornado anymore. So you can't see yet. Uh, like a funnel cloud, yeah. A funnel cloud is just a tornado that hasn't touched the ground. Once it touches the ground, that's when it becomes a tornado. Okay, so we're going to get to make sure I answered all your questions here. Uh, someone asked, uh, what's materials? Tell us about the Earth's climate history. Uh, that's a good climatology question, and I'm not a climatologist, but a lot of the things they use, they actually go to the places like Antarctica and they dig up uh, pieces of ice and they can tell how old it is based on what's inside the ice. They can tell what the temperature was. Sometimes they look at things like uh, trees, uh, see what kind of rings the trees have. So climatologists you do a lot of cool things that uh, meteorologists don't do, uh, but they just kind of get to play around with their stuff as well. Um, how are winds possible in places with only cold air like the North Pole? Think about this here. The whole idea of weather is that the Earth is trying to balance out all the imbalances that happen. Every morning the sun comes up, right? And yeah. as soon as the sun's energy starts to beat down, it starts to churn things up. And it happens across the whole globe. So even though it's a lot hotter down here toward the equator and a lot colder up here toward the North Pole, the whole idea of weather is that it wants to send the warm air northward toward the North Pole and it wants to send the cold air southward. So everything kind of balances out. But it's never, ever, ever going to balance itself out because we always have the sunrise every day. And that's why we have weather. And things like hurricanes are trying to send warm air from the tropics northward toward the poles. And like in the wintertime, we have big storms out of Canada. It's trying to bring colder air and push it southward to balance things out. But it's never going to be able to achieve that perfect balance. Uh, this question was, what kind of waves do we use to detect the weather? Remember Rose as the radar? We were talking about that electromagnetic spectrum. <clears throat> this might be getting a little bit uh, into more like high school science, but this is that spectrum. A spectrum is something that like on one side of it there is really high, and on one side of it there is really low. And on this whole spectrum, we can only see what is right here. I know it's too small to see there, but that's what's called visible lights. So like we can tell the lights are on because we can see it with our eyes. But if I fell off my bike and I broke my leg, I would use an x-ray 
and those wavelengths come a lot faster. It goes, it goes a lot faster. So uh, I can't see it still, but it's, it's powerful enough to see past my skin, <laughs> through my blood, and see what the bones look like. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have things closer to where the Doppler radar tower is, and like uh, AM and FM radio, like what you listen to in your car. You don't see those waves flying in the sky uh, that you're listening to with the music, but you can tell it's there because you can actually hear it. So uh, they go slower on this side of the spectrum, like with the Doppler radar and AM radio. They go really, 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 really fast when you're getting the X-rays. Yeah. Um, the next question was, how do the seasons affect weather systems? Here's an idea. Is it colder? Well, here it's kind of the same all year long, but in the wintertime, does it get hotter or colder? Colder. Colder. So what would happen, thinking back to the thermometer here, if the temperatures start to fall close to 32 degrees or below, what happens to rain? It turns into snow. It turns into snow or sleet or frozen ice pellets. It's not here, unfortunately, unless you don't have snow. Uh, so that's what happens. The, the colder it is outside, the the more impact systems, like what kind of uh, precipitation you're going to get from a typical system. Uh, we talked about the tools that we're going to check via storm. We use things like a barometer, uh, weather balloons, satellites, and the most important one would be the Doppler radar. Uh, what happens when high and low pressure systems mix? You guys know the answer to this one, I bet. How can you tell there's a high and a low pressure system around? <laughs> what do you think? I think you might have done this experiment already. What do you think? Uh, it's um, by the, the, the whoa. I forgot what it's called. That's okay. Uh, how about this? Inside the balloon, I've just blown a lot of air. So right now, inside the balloon, there's really high pressure when you compare it to the room around me where there's low pressure. So what's going to happen if I let my fingers go? The air is going to go from the area of high pressure to, to low bit, pressure. And and just... What is that called? It starts with a W. Ends with a D, has four letters. Wind. Wind. Yeah, so we're going to make wind right there. <laughs> so the air moved from the high pressure into the low pressure out here, and it made wind. You get the idea? That's exactly what happens on the whole world. There's one more here. What's the most important research you've ever made about the weather? You know, I think it was when I was your age, and my grandparents were showing me how barometers work. And I thought that was the coolest thing, that my grandpa could show me how the pressure was falling and that we would be expecting storms the next day. I thought that was so cool. Uh, so that's probably the most important thing, because that's what sparked my interest in weather in the first place. Yeah? Did you get storms the next day? What's that? Did you get storms the next day? We sure did, yeah. <laughs> Not always. Sometimes the weather guy's wrong, but oftentimes, yeah. Okay, so I think we have uh, just a minute or two left. The last question I have for you is, would you mind if I got your picture and I can uh, put it on TV? Yes. 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 And if you don't want to be, you don't have to be. But the next time I'll be on TV will be this Saturday at 6 o'clock on NBC2.